This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome everybody to this week's Doc and Jock. On the Detroit Sports Podcast Network, I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me, my guy, Adam, the Jock Strozinski. Finally, after going through training camp, a 2023 Dream Detroit Lions season that was uh, that included the NFC Championship game, and then the draft, and then OTAs and minicamp, finally, six weeks where the Doc doesn't have to go to practice. We can talk about the final OTA that took place The Lions are on vacation. Everybody's happy. It was great. There was a rules violation in the mix there, so that was interesting to look at, which kind of made things actually so much better to have a three-day weekend. Maybe in the future, the Lions will decide that that Tuesday is actually better than that Monday. But it made some things difficult for the planned media combine because half the media just just said, you know what, it's Tuesday, young players about three quarters of the media didn't show up. It was just the beat writers and everyday, everyday people and a couple of TV people, and that was that. So we'll talk about the Detroit Lions and what their summer, what that looks like, and what our expectation, uh, what our expectations and excitement is for training camp. But to start, cause if you've been checking in with the Detroit Tigers, and it's a tough watch, but there are some interesting storylines now that. Spencer Torkelson is now in the minors. There's other guys that are getting opportunity. Uh, other guys that are getting their opportunity to see what they're about. And you look at it, and the strength of this team. If you really look at it, clearly everyone understands that the Tigers. When you see them, their offense is hit or miss. There are times when they put up five or more runs, and that's really sweet and that's awesome. They tend to end up winning a lot of those ball games, as do most major league teams. But when you really take a look at the pitching staff. It's really intriguing when you look at the top end. The, uh, the Detroit Tigers have a bona fide ace, and it's Tariq Skubal. It's nice to see. I think he's 8-1 and one or something like that, and he's got a, a really sub uh, 2.0 uh, earned run average, and every outing is must-see. And so for the better part of a month, I've watched each and every Tariq Skubal outing, and the, the man's a bulldog. And it's crazy because we've had the debates and the discussion regarding what do you do with a bulldog that could net you so much stuff. But at the very least, when we critique a team, we do want to be fair. Tariq Skubal, I think, should be in the conversation as MVP more than just Cy Young. I think that without Tariq Skubal, this, this baseball team probably would be 15 games under 500. He's must He's must-see box office. Uh, I, I thought that the doubleheader I got a chance to check out with Tariq Skubal in the morning – uh, in the 12 o'clock game and then the 3.30 game with Skeens was legendary. It was awesome. Two pitchers, two Bulldogs going at it. And I think that, look, I can understand the argument, and clearly we're of the opinion that w- w- <laughs> Scott Harris has to show us a lot more before we commit to trusting him to rebuild this team and get 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 talent. So uh, I don't know what what level of prospect because in the past the prospects that have been brought here from the Justin Verlander trade – uh, G.D. Martinez haven't netted a whole heck of a lot. So trading Tariq Skubal on paper sounds great, but right now, man, he's box office. And for you and I, I know we value pitching. I think that uh, a long-term commitment for this guy is probably in order. I think that 27 years old, it's hard to find starting pitching, and I think you got an ace bulldog at least for the next five years. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And, and here's the deal, right? So if you look at where this team's currently positioned and you look at where they're at as far as wildcard standings go, this team's right there. They're just on the outside looking in. And if you look at all the teams who are ahead of them, right, you got Baltimore, you got Kansas City, you got Minnesota, Toronto, Boston, you kind of start going through those teams not that much better than the Tigers, Tigers are right there. You look at a long-term commitment for a guy like Tarek Skubal, I think that goes a long way. I think it goes a long way to giving this fan base a little bit of hope. I think it goes a long way in that locker room, giving them a little bit of confidence as they try to possibly make a push for for a playoff berth, for a wild card. Uh, I Look, Tarek Skubal is, at this moment in time, pitching out of his mind. The guy's like, 
top five, top ten in all pitching stats. The guy has almost 11 strikes per nine innings. That's outrageous. He's a sub nine whip. It's it's incredible what he's doing right now. Every time he goes out there, it's going to be a quality start. Every time he goes out there, he gives his ball club a chance to win. I think this is one of those pieces, one of those foundational pieces. You know, you've heard Scott Harris say this a lot. You've also heard uh, the, the coaching staff talk about this quite a bit as well. They're looking for those core pieces, looking for those core guys. This is a guy you should – I know he's got arbitration left. I get it, right? But this is a guy you go out, you extend early. You make that financial commitment to him now. It'll probably save you some money on the back end. That's number one. But you extend him now. I think it gives it, – it, it's almost like an olive branch. It's, a, it's an olive branch of goodwill where this, this front office is basically telling the fan base, we get it. We understand we got a guy here who is a dog and who is a stud. We are going to extend him now. We're going to use him as a piece that we're going to build around. We are going to make a push for a playoff run, and we're going to to try to do it all this year. He is a core member of this team, and we feel like with him as our ace, Jack Flaherty as our number two guy, and Jack Flaherty's having a, a fantastic year. And that's a guy who I think later on in the season, as we get through the trade deadline, if, if the Tigers do what we hope that they do, and they do make a push for a playoff berth, Jack Flaherty's going to be a guy that you're, we're going to have to talk about bringing back and, and giving him an extension because he's on a one-year deal right now. But this guy's pitching almost as good as Tarek Skubal. He is a solid, solid number two. He is a great uh, 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 if Tarek Skubal, to as Tarek Skubal is Tom, he is a great Jerry. Uh, he's a another part of that dynamic duo with those two guys up top there. And then you can look at uh, who you've got as your third pitcher, whether it's Reese Olson, who the Tigers can't seem to find any offense when he's on the mound, um, or or anybody else you'd like to kind of slide in there as that number third guy. But uh, Tarek Skubal, Jack Flaherty are both pitching outstanding. And you're right. That's where the strength of this team is. And I think if you go out and you make this financial commitment to him, it is sending a message to not just the fan base, but it's also sending a message through that locker room that we're going to go for it. We're going to try to actually win the season. We're not just going to mail it in and we're not just going to wave the white flag. And you try to maybe at the trade deadline go out and get a piece. I'm not saying that you've got to mortgage your future. I'm not saying that you've got to give up a ton of prospects. This is where it's impended on on Scott Harris to do some some research. Go out, try to target a guy, find a guy who he feels can come in and give you some good at bats, help give you a little bit of offensive power to kind of help balance out this pitching staff. But Terry Skubal right now, definite MVP candidate. The guy's doing stuff that that Clayton Kershaw did when uh, when he won the MVP and he won the Cy Young. So I think there is is legitimate pause here where you need to see the front office do something. The front office has to get off its ass. Chris Illich has to show that he's connected to this team. He's not just kind of out there every time that they want to add a, a, a add a new expensive area in the ballpark or every time they add a gigantic scoreboard. Here's the thing. Nobody wants to go down and watch your team if you're not going to invest in your own team. Nobody cares if there's a giant scoreboard. Nobody wants to buy uh, those new home run, uh, home plate, expensive ass tickets. Those 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 executive seats. Nobody wants to pay the money for those. If you're not willing to invest in your product, investing in a guy like Tarek Skubal, I think goes a long way. Not just this year, but also for the future of this team. It does. It shows a little bit of, of faith in that. Hey, that this organization is going to spend. And I think that once Scott Harris did the, the rounds. And his love of talking to MLB Network hasn't really done him good because every time he goes on there, he's just repeating the same thing, which is, look, we have a budget. We're sticking to it. We're not really at the point yet where we think that uh, we're at the point where we're going to be super competitive in the, in the postseason. So we're just going to kind of stick with it. And it kind of is like, man, you know, many people believe that if they added one or two bats, this baseball team, when you really look at it based on their record, a lot of teams – come from the wild card and end up having World Series success. But maybe he's just being honest and blunt. And he's like, look, we understand this is a young baseball team and we just sent our former number one pick to the minors. So that's where we're at. That's what we're looking at, guys. So don't be in denial. He said it before the, the season. He's like, look, we're trying to establish who our everyday players are. Clearly, Tariq Skubal is one of them. Clearly, Jack Flaherty could be another one. Maybe Riley Green now has emerged as being a guy that they can trust. 
And it stunk because once the offense went cold, the pitching staff was very reliable, then the bullpen kind of went cold. And that's why they're sitting, as we record, two games under 500. And their recent loss to Washington was brutal. After having scored the Little League world, uh, home run, it was kind of interesting with Riley Green, but they ended up losing in extra innings. So it's a baseball team that's been hovering around 500, one or two games uh, under 500 or so, and that's where this baseball team is frustrating in that you could see that maybe they just don't believe, that they, they realize, okay, we're an average baseball team and we know the, the weaknesses. But I, mean, I want to ask you this. Was it wrong? Look, I took glee in knowing and in, in finding out that Javier Baez had a lumbar back situation. No, you don't want somebody to have to deal with that and pain and stuff like that. But when that news came out on Tuesday, I smiled. I said, okay, the baseball team got better. And, of course, we always joke around with bad players and say, okay, a 10-day injury maybe should be six months. And everybody understood it that, that, that read the tweet at Detroit Podcast. They understood that, look, Javier Baez is a player that is, every time you, you, you throw him out there, is, is aiding your baseball team to lose. And I thought it was crazy that it's bad. And it's hysterical because you never hear this. It's hysterical that a manager would look and stoop so far to be positive, to share with the newspapers that, man, we're just so proud of the way he covers the base and tags other players. It's just elite. Now, we can see when Kreidler botches a play and it's a defensive error. Well, okay, defense is important. But at the same token... I'll take anybody but Javier Baez on this baseball team. I was happy. It put a, it made me smile. And I was just like, you know what? I think another good sign, cuz, even if they don't add anybody, I think the next sign of faith would be just cut the, the man a fucking check and tell him hit the road jack and don't come back no more because I don't want to see him on the diamond. I don't want to see him play. Every time he swings at pitches that are outside the strike zone, it's infuriating and it's just an easy out. And... You can't dig that deep. No manager has to talk about how a a defender tags a runner as a strength to put that and have people defend that. And if you're a beat writer to to report that, I just think you're asking to get laughed at. I mean, okay, yeah, Javier Baez has good defense. Okay, but I think that you can um, just bypass writing about him because he's infuriating. He's, he's, He's a player that is just a situation in which sometimes there is such a thing as addition by subtraction. Lobbing a check to Javi, I think, would send such goodwill that you could probably bypass the rest of the season and just be average, and whatever happens, happens, just by moving on and booting a guy that nobody in the fan base likes or respects. Look, I, I agree with you 100%. It, it comes across as disingenuous, right? When, when you hear those comments, it's like, come on, man, are you for real right now? Like, wh- what are we talking about? This is a guy who regularly is a hole in your lineup and is regularly a guy who who cripples you the, the, the big weak link on this team is batting right the 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 massive weak link that that holds this team back is the offense they can't generate runs they can't score runs uh if you if you watch their loss the other night to to um to the nationals it, they got into the 10th and they they had nothing there was nothing they could do to to get a run home to try to extend that inning it's frustrating to watch Javi Baez is a black hole in that everyday lineup. I think this right here works perfectly for the Detroit Tigers. I think this sets them up perfectly where they can start to transition away from him. You can start to kind of weed him out of your lineup, see what you have as far as some of the other players on your roster, play them, see if you get more production from them. And at that point, I feel like it's it's it, 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 it is on AJ Hinch, it's on Scott Harris to have this meeting with Chris Illich and be like, look, he's killing us. Cut him a check, let him go. And, and, and look, Chris Illich, again, beacon of goodwill, olive branch to the fan base. You know, you you extend a guy like Tarek Skubal and then you cut a check for, uh, for, for Javi Baez to go away. These are two things that would garner you so much more respect in this town if you just did it and it would make your make your team that much more watchable so look i I agree with you 100 i was excited when i found out that he's going to be on the ir i know it's a horrible thing to say but again he's a guy who hampers your lineup every single day and he doesn't give you a whole ton i get it he plays he plays a pretty good defense right the guy can 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 handle the defensive side of his responsibilities there are other guys who are going to be able to step in and do 
just as much, but they'll be able to give you a little bit more on the other side when they're at the plate and you're trying to drive runs in. This guy is a negative war. You can go and find a a triple A or even a double A player and sub him in, and he's going to give you just as much, if not more, production. And I think that right there is the one thing that is the the hardest thing to stomach about watching Javi Baez. You can go get a guy from the minor leagues, whether it's triple A or whether it's double A, put them into your lineup, and they're going to give you just as much production, if not more. And when you're paying him as much money as you're paying him, look, I get it. You don't want to just write a check for a guy to go sit on a couch. I totally understand that. But if he's hurting your team, you got to do what you got to do. And if it's, it's again, on Chris Illich to open up that checkbook and, again, garner a little bit of respect in this town because right now fans can't stand to see Chris Illich's face. Fans don't want to hear anything from Chris Illich. Fans – I'm surprised that they're not at Comerica picketing outside of the stadium ready to burn it down because they're tired of Chris Illich. So I think this right here allows the Tigers this opportunity where they can really kind of go through their 40-man roster. If they've got to call somebody up, maybe see what you got and, and, and just try it out and see what you get from somebody else on this roster and, and roll a different lineup out there and see if it gives you anything better because I bet you it will. Yeah, no doubt. And so when you look at it, it, it kind of has the feel of a team that's going to stay put at the at the trade deadline. I don't see them making a block. What would you want trade. them to do? Would you want them to trade for somebody, or do you want them to to maybe trade a couple pieces away? What What would you if, if the doc was Scott Harris? What would the doc be doing? Would you just kind of hold pat, or would you try to maybe go out there and make a blockbuster move, or would you possibly be a seller? I feel like a team. Uh, a squad is going to make an offer. I feel like a general manager could make an offer for Tariq Skubal that's in contention. And you recognize, okay, what kind of prospects can you get back? You need a top five in an organization, top five in all of baseball. And it's just tough because pitchers just don't grow on trees. And I just think that unless it's a multiple prospects and just a, a deal that blows everybody away universally, I just think they're going to stand pat. I don't think they make any move. I think they just roll with it. They realize they have – uh, a 500 team, and they recognize too that Kerry Carpenter, if they can get something back from him in the second half of the year, if Torkelson finds that spark, I mean, that's what sucks about the minors is that he he's a 4A player, is that he's probably good for the minors. He's he's too good. He'll hit, he'll get hits, but when it comes to 97 mile an hour fastballs, he's just late on it, and that's just what makes it difficult. Is that at the next level, you don't see too many guys throwing 97 in the minors with with consistency and accuracy. So. We'll see how it plays out. I hope I'm wrong. I hope they do make additions. You know, a solid bat would be great, but I just think it's tough because you just haven't seen the track rec- track record yet. And it's a baseball team that's just really an 80, 81-win team at most. It's just the way it is with everything going on, devoid of elite offensive talent, but can get hot at certain times and can play well. Um, and that's what's crazy is that I just think that what's tough is that Major League Baseball, in terms of the AL, you're only a couple games out of the wild card. So that's what's crazy is that you're still in contention at the time of this recording in middle of June. So that's what makes it crazy is that this baseball team is under 500. And that's what the expansion of, of the playoffs has done is that under 500 teams can get to the postseason and make it interesting. But realistically, it's not a competitive playoff team. So I'm just enjoying game by game, series by series, and enjoying the opportunity that that the Tigers have had to compete and, and create some memories within games. But yeah, by and large, it's it's a baseball team that you kind of know. It's average, and those are the key storylines that we talked about. But Tariq Skubal, my goodness, I think that he deserves to be in the conversation for MVP, and hopefully he sticks around because, man, when you have a reason to go, you have a reason to tune in, it's great. And for a lot of fans to have a person that reminds them of Justin Verlander, a Bulldog, somebody like a Max Scherzer that every fifth day goes out there and dominates, it's, it's a great season and one in which you should take advantage of and see. Now, speaking of taking advantage, the Pistons are taking advantage of whatever it is that time has given them to uh, announce or formally have Trajan, Lang- uh, Trajan Langdon do an interview. And it's crazy in that the way in which it was announced was people found out on his on his social media page. And the Pistons are taking advantage and just kind of making everybody wait. And everyone is kind of joking around in the media like, when are the Pistons going to announce that Trajan Langdon, uh, when are they going to have the press conference to have a conversation about the future of the of the franchise. And it kind of maybe has started some whispers, cause that maybe Monty Williams, the discussion this week is maybe how much 
of the check he's willing to, uh, how much of a buyout is he willing to accept? So the draft is only two weeks away, which is crazy. And when you talk to anybody about the Pistons, they just laugh and chuckle, whether it be media or fans. They just go, they don't understand what is going on with the Pistons, this level of secrecy. But first and foremost, clearly we've talked about how defunct the Pistons are. I mean, it's been, you know, a while now. It's been a couple weeks, and Trajan Langdon has made moves, and people are whispering and reporting on stuff that he's done without a formal press conference for anybody in the media to, to look at the direction of the Pistons. Is anyone surprised? I'm not. It's kind of the way everybody kind of talks about the Pistons is giving them the side eye, like they're run defunct. But they're taking their sweet-ass time, but it kind of lends to maybe some high-level buyout discussions. So I want to ask this. We've talked about it. We've hinted at it. Is Monty Williams the ultimate OG? Is he somebody? We've talked about it, but now we can re- re- realistically look at it. Did he foreshadow this? Is he that much of a wizard that he recognized? You know what? Let me look here. They begged me for this job. Troy Weaver kind of has put together one of the worst rosters ever. I mean, he's pretty much, Monty Williams knew that that roster would suck. He recognized, you know what? Do what I can do, but there's a chance here. They're paying me a boatload of money, and there's a chance here that if, if I play my cards right and I, and I foreshadow it, Troy Weaver's probably going to get fired. And if Troy gets fired, if we win 30 games, the fan base hates him. If Troy gets fired, there's a chance somebody else is going to come in. And most of the time, when new people come in, they're just going to fire people. And so he recognized, you know what? I could put in one year of work, get $13 million, and then get a check for probably north of $50 million to walk away. Do you think that Monty Williams is the ultimate OG and foreshadowed this and took the job knowing that there was a big, strong likelihood he'd get a buyout? It almost smells like that, doesn't it? I mean, it kind of feels like that. It's it's one of those things where I kind of felt like Monty Williams was almost bullied into this, right? Like they, they came at him and they threw him so much money. He was like, I'll be stupid to say no. He's like, I, my heart's not in it, but I mean, you're offering me this much money. I, I feel like he had to have looked at the roster and was like, this just isn't going to work with what I want to do. So worst case scenario, I roll in here, we crap the bed and... Uh, yeah, you guys just pit buy me out. It, it almost feels like like that. It, it just to me, it is so weird the way that this organization is is ran. I mean, do you realize we are now two weeks out from the NBA draft? We we just fired uh, our our general manager and Troy Weaver. You have a new basket a president of basketball operations. But again, like you said, there's been zero announcement. There's been zero press conference. The only way you found out was basically by his LinkedIn page uh, or his or his Twitter and his social media. And we still have no clue what's going on with the head coach. You've got pieces on this team that don't fit what the head coach does. And you're not really sure what their future is. It really feels like everything is kind of in the balance right now. It's just kind of all up in the air. And you're you're just kind of waiting for some direction. Again, Tom Gores, who is an owner who is basically absent all the time anyways, this is a point where you would just kind of hope that he would come out and and say something, uh, come out and and, and talk. Look, I I get what you're saying where there's a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff probably going on right now where Trajan Langdon is is working through putting a staff together. He's trying to figure out what they're going to do with Monty Williams. Again, drafts two weeks out, so that's a big deal. You've got the number five overall pick, so you've got to make some decisions on what you're doing there. Uh, I, I get all these things are going on, but you would almost hope that things would be expedited a little bit, and you would at least go through the process of having the introductory press conference <laughs> for your new president of basketball operations, and we could possibly get a little bit of direction, ask a couple of questions Find out a little bit about what the team is thinking because right now everybody's basically doing what we're doing right now. We're sitting around and we're just kind of bouncing ideas off each other. We're kind of talking and there's just a lot of conjecture and everybody's pretty frustrated because you've got no clue what this team's going to do, what this team's planning on doing. I think the thing that 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 has come out and that we've heard a little bit about is it sounds like Trajan Langdon has a couple of ideas for free agents. This team has a ton of cap space, and they've got to spend a ton of money to get to the NBA's uh, uh, basement for the salary cap. So it, it sounds like they're going to be spenders in free agency. 
But does all of that translate with your head coach, who's your current head coach, or does all that translate with who maybe your future head coach will be? And that leads us right back to the original question, and that is, what the hell is going on with the Detroit Pistons right now? Because nobody knows. Nobody knows. It, it, to me, it's absolutely nuts that we are in this position. And look, Trajan Langdon was hired how long ago? Almost two weeks ago, right? If math serves me correct, and if I can remember everything, I've got, I've got baby brain right now. Uh, this is what happens when you sleep about two hours every night. I think it was about two weeks ago he was brought in, and, and we basically discovered that he is going to be the new president of basketball operations. And again, no presser. No idea what's going on with Monty. Troy Weaver's been shipped out in a casket, and now the draft's two weeks away. So it is a weird time for the Detroit Pistons. Do do you have any? What, what would you want to do? What would you want to happen if if you were put in Trajan Langdon's position? Right? Would you want to keep Monty Williams, or would you want to ship him out in the same casket that Troy Weaver was shipped out in? Mm. I mean, you figure that the way in which he coached last year was not worthy of being the highest paid. But I think Monty Williams is a good coach. So I think that if you have a transitional coach, I know it's the highest paid, but you're, you're in here. I think if you're a general manager, you, you, you take advantage of the fact that, hey, this is a guy that you can sit with with a year, you get a free year, and you go. But at the same token, you realize there's, there's a lot of assistance on the Pelicans that are tied to Trajan Langdon. And so I just I would roll with Monty Williams. I think he's the best option. And you upgrade the talent. You get him some shooters. You get him. You, you sit with Monty and say, "Okay, tell me the names you want, and we'll go get them." And simple as that. And Monty Williams. Well, how do you feel about this? A good roster. He could take a team to the NBA Finals. And it, and if at best, Monty Williams is a transitional coach. That's fine until you find the guy that's championship caliber. But I think Monty Williams. I mean, it's hard. It, I mean, literally, it's not your money. But you recognize, too, that you're getting your boss to scratch a $50 million check. I mean, man, that's a big mistake, and that's on Tom Gordon. But for them, it's not a big deal. I mean, he, he'll make that in a year, you know? So look, he might make that in a quarter. You, you never know in regards to profits and all that kind of shit. And you recognize, to them, it's not a big deal. It's just egg on your face to, to have to scratch a check to somebody to leave for $50 million, and he'll walk away potentially with $65 million for one year for 14 wins. <laughs> it's embarrassing at the highest level. So I just think you, you need to get shooters. I know that I, I love the talk of Gary Harris. That that's great. But right now all the moves are intermediate. You have to draft well. And you just basically what I want Trajan Langdon to do is whoever that number five pick is, you have to hit. Your first pick has to hit, has to score, has to be a contributor. And you got to figure out how, the direction of the team. Clearly, when he speaks, will have an ident- a kind of a direction as to what they're looking for. And clearly, they, they need shooters. They need athletes, shooters, defenders, guys that are competitive and pieces that fit. And I think that's what he's going to say. And clearly, Trajan Langdon knows what a shooter looks like. So there's more renewed optimism. So he gets the benefit of the doubt. But I think one of the first key decisions is, what do you do with Monty? And I think it's kind of trending towards people thinking that he's going to get bought out. And, um, man, if you're Monty Williams, you're sitting back and you're going cha-ching, he had to have known. Somebody had to have told him that second goal round when the team was begging, like, look, man, they're throwing millions at you. Take it. And, and worst case scenario, they say, you know, look, you know, best case scenario, you stay three, four years, you're collecting $13 million, you're on easy street, you go, you handle business. Nobody expects Detroit really to win that's realistic, that cares about basketball. Go take their money. And worst case scenario, one, two years, you serve a sentence – you know, a two-year sentence in Detroit in basketball purgatory, and you get, you know, he can get twenty-six million and, and twenty-five in a buyout. So forty million for two years potentially minimum. You're, you just go, you know what? Let's just go do it and see what happens. And that's how Monty acted. He, he, you just need him to show a little more passion, a little more fire, a little more like, hey, pretend like you want to be here and act like you're invested and desperate, at just as much as the fan base who are chanting sell the team, who care, who are invested, act a little bit. Like, hey, that you want to be here and be part of the turnaround. And that's not what happened. And I think that's where uh, the, the Pistons, Tigers, Red Wings can learn a little bit from the Lions in that. And look at us talking about the Lions being the trendsetter. They put together a synergy of Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes. They didn't, even, they didn't know each other all that well, but they figured, you know what? You two, your job is to work together. Make it work. So that's what they did. They said, uh, Brad Holmes, you know, looked at players and said, I want gritty, hardworking guys. Dan Campbell said, I want gritty, hardworking guys. And guys that are not too much prima donnas, maybe one or two on this roster, but we want guys that are a little bit hungry, that have been kind of cast aside, that have been told that, they, that they're that they not good enough and projects and guys that we think we see the, the football knowledge and just maybe basically a four-star guy that we can turn into a five-star guy. 
and let's just kind of pick and choose maybe one or two kind of divas and, and roll with that. And that's what they need to do is they need to have synergy. The, these guys got to have uh, uh, an, an operation where you understand exactly what the new head coach or Monty Williams needs to be successful, and you get those groceries. You say, okay, Monty, what do you like? What do you need? Go ahead. We got you, and work together. And, and that's that's why people do that, is that Trajan Langdon will probably identify someone from the Pelicans, but we'll see. I think it could work with Monty Williams, but my God, I, I just would love to be in that position where you're like, you know what? Tell me, you want to give me 50? I want 55. That year was tough, man. I mean, I, I'm getting talked about as being the worst coach in the NBA. You, you just want to give me 50? I want 55. And, and, and the organization's like, Monty, you got, you got paid for more than a million dollars for the wins you got. You got paid like $1.04 million for the wins. It's like, come on, dude. You got 14 wins and $13 million. So come on, dude, or whatever. You got paid a shit ton of money with not a lot of wins. So let's go here. And we, we can't pay a coach a million dollars a win. So for Monty Williams, he hit the jackpot. And we'll see where it goes as the draft approaches. We'll talk about it next week in regards to um, what we think the best option for the Pistons are at at number five. But we'll see if Monty's still the coach. We'll see if anyone talks. It's interesting. Secrecy going on with the Pistons. Well, you know where there's no secrets? The Detroit Lions. Everything is open, and even so much so that they got caught cheating. And it was great. Like I said earlier, it was fantastic. We get the alert. Monday, practice has been canceled. And the first thing I said was, yes! Yes! Yes, another day off. This is great. And it was so well-deserved. I was like, by now, everyone knows this is the tail end for reporters. Where it's, it's, it's mini camp OTAs, and we can see the six weeks where there's no media access, and we can kind of just sit back and write at our own leisure. Or we can write in the morning or in the afternoon or don't have to be on this torrid pace. from training. From basically, uh, from training camp until the beginning of June, it's all. It's every day, all day, from training camp to the regular season to the draft to then introductions of the players to rookie minicamp to things. It is literally a 11th month job, but with a six week break, it is great. And uh, now we have reached that point. So that's why you hear the extra energy in my voice. The first couple days, no Lions media availability. It was great. Even the media, kind of, you could tell. Uh, there was supposed to be a media combine that took place on Monday. But like six dudes signed up for it. Even the Lions own guy was like, oh, I tore my labrum. I never do it because uh, I'm like you. I don't want them to have, they have uh, literally access to my rights, my uh, video rights uh, in my, um, what do they say? Uh, The way professionally they say is they have rights to the footage of me practicing in in perpetuity. So they can run in five years. If I get uh, successful at a bigger level, they can show me falling flat on my face Anytime mm-hmm. they want, if I if if I succumb to a drill that's not great, so I'm like, I I could take my own camera crew out there and do all that too. They don't care, but I don't want my footage <laughs> run in regards to pictures or in videos or in uh, highlight packages where millions could see me falling on my face. I think it's a. I was joking around. I said this this should be for people 40 and under, but there were, half the media didn't show up. It was a Tuesday. It's light. It's a lot of special teams drilled, not a lot of juice, and the players run off the field. Literally, they, they, they roll in packs of five and try to get off the field as soon as possible. And so I think three to four players talked each day, and the final day is really just talking to the position coaches, getting a lot of insights from the coaches, which is still tough in and of itself. Eight coaches talk and trying to sift through all of that. We, we do it a little bit at a time at All Lions and what we'll do here on the podcast. But all in all, it was great to be part of it. Because you're getting to a chance to see the makings of a great football team and how it's put together. We're seeing the ingredients kind of being put together. We're seeing the dough being rolled. We're seeing the dough being put together before it gets put in the oven. And it's great to see. You're seeing the young ingredients, the young, talented players like Terry and Arnold, who you can see doing drills and look so fluid at Detroit Podcast. And it's great, too. I, I, it's, I'm curious why the others have not taken a camera out there and, and shot footage you're allowed to. I know that the rules say now you can't take cell phone videos, but hey, there's no rule that says you can't take a, a camera and, and start shooting. And so I said, okay. And and, and it's great because I know you guys like it. So I think that what you got to see, the bright spot was a swagger and an acknowledgement that, hey, goal number one, win the Super Bowl, nothing else. And I think finally, you can look at this football team as one of the elite, one of the top five teams in the entire league. And if everything goes to form, there's a chance to be competitive. And I think the brightest spot has been 
the revamped defense and the way that they performed and the swagger and the shit talking that they did and the competitiveness, the making the, the offense's life a little difficult with led by Tyrion Arnold, Carlton Davis. I think the improved defense should give people confidence that they're not the top 10, but they're not in the, they're, they're, they're somewhere between 10 and 15 right now. And that's a good starting point. And with, with evolution, with maybe adding at the trade deadline and everybody staying healthy and everybody taking steps forward, this football team has a chance to win a lot of games and be one of those great teams that we talk about. And to be a part of it, to see the beginnings of it is great. I love it. I just don't like all the work that, it, and, and now there's more people doing it. I mean, because since we've started the podcast, every outlet doing a podcast, which is great because I can joke around with uh, the one or two guys that are not doing it. I'm like, you, you're not doing a podcast yet? And they're like, they won't pay me. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, there's another way to do this, media member, is do the podcast, show that you get numbers, then they'll pay you. It's kind of kind of the way it goes. But uh, you can see when they're, they're like, you, you can see the way the media rolls and that they're like, it's another thing to do. Since we started, you know, there was only a handful of outlets covering. Now there are four more besides All Lions and the Pride of Detroit. There's four more that are doing it similar. Sporting News has gotten into it. A to Z Sports has gotten into it. A couple blogs are getting into it. It's like, oh my goodness, the coverage of the Lions. They got their hands full because the the number of people that want to cover that team is going to be ginormous. And there were some media members covering. National SI came, SI National came, CBS Sports National came to OTAs and mandatory minicamps. So it's a great thing. What's been something that's, you know, to you been the biggest, brightest spot? Because when you look at this football team, it's just been all excitement, you know, really recognizing second year players are going to emerge. Rookies are decent. The veterans are talented and you have some stars emerging in Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamison Williams, where you look at it across the board, you're like, there's some good football players across the board with this that are affiliated with the Detroit Lions. They're on the Lions roster, and we get to see them and talk about them and be up close and be a part of a franchise that is moving forward and not being talked about, not a laughingstock anymore, being talked about and being respected. I, I think for me, it's the conversation about Brian Branch being a larger part of this defense and then being able to work him around into different positions. I think that's been the thing that's been one most interesting to me. And again, the brightest spot, because this is a guy that you drafted last year. This, this is, this was possibly the steal of the draft. And now you're going to put more on his plate. And he showed you what he could do in his rookie season, which was phenomenal. He was an excellent player in his rookie season. So expecting big things and expecting him to take large steps forward, Similar to what you said, seeing that defense improve and get much better. Uh, so he has been the one guy who has really stuck out a lot to me. Uh, I, I did want to get your take because you are there. You're basically embedded in camp all the time. What has been your take on on Hendon Hooker? Uh, he's gotten a lot of play uh, through these OTAs. He's been a, a a focal point for this offense. They're really trying to get him, I feel, up to speed and trying to put more and more on his plate each and every day that he's out there. What's been your take on, on his progression as uh, essentially a rookie? Because – he didn't play at all last year. So, yeah. yeah, he had the textbook, and, yeah, he had uh, a bit of an idea of what the uh, offensive concept is. But this is a guy who is a little bit unfamiliar with an offense like this. If you compare this to what he did when he was in Tennessee and you compare it to to kind of where he's at now, uh, it, it's going to be some growing pains, going to be some, some, some struggles there I'm anticipating. So I want to get what – your take is on on kind of what you've seen through camp and does he have the ability to to lock down that that QB2 spot it just shows you the difference between an elite starting level quarterback that has a system in place built for him like Jared Goff and a rookie that's still struggling at square one of understanding uh the 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 huddle lining up snap count and understanding situations it, it, it to, to me it's just when you have a quarterback like Jared Goff, you would, I personally would like a little more competition. Somebody that right now leaving leaving OTAs and mini camps, you'd say, okay, ready to go. And in Hooker, oh my God, he was making situational mistakes that got him yelled at, and stuff that's kind of really, I think too, maybe just kind of being overwhelmed. Like you know, it's late game situation. Why are you checking it down? There's like three seconds left with no timeouts. It's like you clearly know that's a mental mistake. And one in which he's got to make it, and it's and it's spring. You hope that when training camp comes, he looks a lot better. And the st- because I look at it like he studied for a year. What was he studying? 
Like you would think that he'd at least understand like, hey, huddle, line up, see the defense, run the play and run it right. But cause he held the ball too long, it looked like a true rookie. Like it's I don't want to see that. I wanted to I wanna see like a backup. Like I want to see like a JJ McCarthy in there, like somebody that could compete and at least look like he he, he had played but he played in a year. So that's where it's just challenging, and I see a situation in which this is a raw developmental quarterback, and this is one in which, you know, um, in practice, you saw all the warts. And I, to, to me, I, I guess I look at it, like, from the lens of, I don't want to see the warts. Like, I get it. It's practice. It's, it's like, you know, it's, if you're a fan of wrestling, like, I don't want to see the workout training. I don't want to see the bumps where the two guys run into each other and go, oh, shit, here, let's, let's do that again. I want to see it where they have a practice and it's like technical where it's like, no, 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 here, you could have did the hip drop, then the, then the rollover, then the kick out, then this, then the pin, and, and, and being a little bit more advanced than where he is. Like right now we're seeing the, the raw quarterback that's like, you know, waiting forever and getting sacked in practice drills and there's no pads on. And so to get sacked, to take a sack in a seven on seven drill or a team rep is crazy because you can just throw the ball anywhere. I mean, literally, the, the 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 blocking schemes are not that intense. So to hold the ball that long, where a defender can be close to you, that means you're holding on to the ball way too long. He did that far too often, threw way too many interceptions, and so to me, I don't I don't like seeing that. I want to see the highest level of play from a backup. I want I wanted to write, man, maybe Hendon with this football team could lead them to the Super Bowl. You know, and you you can't write that now objectively. He's not, at this point, realistically, he's the number three. I hate to tell you guys, I'm telling you, from my eyes, he's the number three quarterback. He's having trouble with the basics. And um, he fundamentally, in this spring, it looks like he's a true, true rookie. And it's, it's wild because he's 26 years old and very mature. But he's got the strong arm, got zip. But the one thing I will say strength-wise is that he did start dropping dimes. And he's smart. He developed connections with the tight ends. Uh, McKeon, Hess, uh, the tight ends on the roster, he definitely targeted because they're so big. I mean, the, the, the Lions brought in like three, six, four tight ends. And the, the Lions quarterbacks definitely found him all throughout camp. And it's smart. It's a safety valve. And I recognize that, um, that my bias and my impatience will probably be wrong because I think he'll take the six weeks to learn and study. And by training camp, if he's still doing the same thing, there's going to be a problem that you'll see. You'll have to see them bring in somebody else or you will start the season with um, Sudfeld as the number two. So he's got a ways to go. But truly to me, I did not want them to draft a true developmental quarterback. That's what they did. So would he, I guess, technically be a kind of a downside, kind of a, uh, a, a, a I guess, a dim spot uh, that you've seen kind of in, in camp? Or is that something that his relationship maybe with the with the wide receivers, his relationship with, I guess, the coaching staff and being able to process everything, is that something that needs to be worked on in your eyes? The, the, the best way to describe it is I wanted somebody to compete for Jared's job, like compete like real close, like be Jared Goff 80%. Okay, we know he's the guy, he's the incumbent, but somebody that tested him and made it so that Jared had to look over his shoulder and go, oh, shit, this guy could take my job. Well, now Jared's got the contract. He's the pimp of the town. And Jared Goff ain't going nowhere. Yeah, and Hendon Hooker is nowhere near understanding the complexities of Ben Johnson's offense. Like, Bear, Jared Goff is is in year five, year four of this, and he's running, like, hey, checks to this in this situation. Hendon Hooker is, is, is like, still in, in his rookie year learning the concepts and the route trees and, and everything yeah. like that. Hendon Hooker didn't work with all the ones all that much. So true. when I say that, I'm saying, guys, this is somebody – that is being groomed to be a backup. And that kind of sucks, you know, uh, at this point of his development. I wanted him to compete to be a starter. Like, he can't go anywhere else and start unless he, like, totally shines. But you don't typically see that, uh, somebody that has a camp like that and then goes into training camp and then just starts lighting it up. I just think that, you know, they recognize that if Jared Goff goes down, I think that everyone should panic, that I don't think Hennon Hooker is going to. Maybe... Maybe it's one of those situations where with a great offensive line, all those weapons, that he could just dink and dunk it around and hand the ball off. But right now... Well, see, that's, that, that's what I was going to ask you. In the middle of June, man, it's he, rough. He, well, he's playing with a lot of the twos and the yes. threes right now, right? Yep. So if he was to be put out there with some of the ones and he gets a little bit more of an understanding of, of the concept and, and all of the route trees, 
do you think there is a chance where if for some reason something horrible was to happen to Jared Goff, Hendon Hooker could slide in and maybe buy them some time until Jared Goff got healthy or possibly even help win them a game? Right now, would you say that's a definite no? Or do you think there's the possibility that he could grow into that as we kind of get through training camp later on? Basically, the name that would, would be understanding to you is he's right now, his peak would be Tyrod Taylor. Somebody that could get up there, run the offense, has some elite skills, but that's where he's working towards. He's nowhere near that right now. Uh, he'd take sacks. He'd throw interceptions. He'd miss reads. He'd throw it to Khalif instead of Amon Ra, who was wide open, and there would be a lot of mistakes. So you hope that the development has to take place over the next few months, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be something in which he's got to take advantage of all the coaching and handle his business. Well, hopefully he gets it all figured out. Yeah. What what else? Since like again, you're you're entrenched down there. You're there damn near every day, uh, ex- uh, unless there's a, a practice getting canceled because the Lions are 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 caught red-handed doing something that they shouldn't be doing. What else needs to be worked on, in your opinion? What else is is kind of a bit of a of a rough spot right now as we kind of work our way through OTAs? Not just Hendon Hooker, but maybe another part of the offense or maybe a part of the defense. I know there was a lot of special teams work that was getting done uh, this week, so maybe it's even something on special teams. Yeah, it was good. Um, special teams looks good. The returns look good. I just think that um, one thing that we're going to need to make sure of is that you know, uh, Ennis Rakestraw, Amik Robertson, going to have question marks, Emmanuel Mosley, when he gets back. The injured players, we need to see how they come back and how they, you know, add to this team. So I look at this opportunity for for this football team to take this this next step. And there's still, you know, when you look at Brian Branch, what does that mean for Ifatu Milifanu? You think he's just going to be happy taking a reserve role if Branch is the safety opposite of Kirby Joseph? Because you, you would probably presume that Amik Robertson would be in the slot. So how much is Ennis Rakestraw going to play? The development of uh, Manu, Colby Sorsdahl, Broderick Martin. So the development of some of the players will be interesting to see over the course of training camp. So there's still some question marks regarding some depth pieces on the offensive line, wide receivers, uh, who's going to compete behind Khalif Raymond at number three. Uh, number three running back as well. Does Vaki take over Craig Reynolds' job? Will be a key thing as well. And then clearly the defensive line. Who is going to be the assistant for Aiden Hutchinson, who's going to be the uh, Batman or who's going to be the Robin to Batman. And we got to figure that out. I think it's going to be James Houston. I think it's going to be Davenport combination. There could be Mekhi Wingo later on in the year, but all those question marks will be answered. And that's, what's great is that right now the talent level is so much better than 2021. If you check out our our video podcast, we posted on Twitter cause seriously in 21, they were, they were, uh, uh, rolling out their Brashad Perriman. And I think to, uh, Terrell Williams as wide receivers. I was like, oh, my God, uh, what the hell were they trying to do in 2021? They had no chance to succeed. And then uh, uh, the running, uh, the wide receiver gets hurt early in his career, and you're just like, oh, my God. Uh, you, you still had Amon Ross St. Brown. If you want to look at his first couple games, they were a little bit rough. He, he didn't start to emerge until the middle of the season when they changed because for some reason Anthony Lynn didn't want uh, – didn't want to use Amon Ross St. Brown, which is crazy, right? Like, how the hell do you not use one of your best players to handle business? And it was wild to see that Brashad Perriman was on this roster and you trying to count, try to give Jared Goff that. But I thought TJ Hawkinson could have been used more. You just see the involvement of the roster and you recognize, wow, how um, how good of a situation this was for how good of a situation it turned out to be for the Lions uh, Tyrell Williams, clearly, just a couple games with the Lions. And just, man, Tyrell Williams, Amon Ross St. Brown, and Brashad Perriman. Whew. And that's why probably if you talk to— That was to, a rough receiving core. If you talk to Anthony Lynn, he's like, why do you think I ran the ball? It was no offense, no disrespect, but we had DeAndre Swift. So we're trying to do some things here. So, um, man, different, di- whole different attitude now, man. You got Aiden— Look, look, cause look at it like this. You got— Jameer Gibbs, MVP candidate. Aiden Hutchinson, uh, rookie. Um, Aiden Hutchinson could potentially be the defensive player of the year. You got Amon Ross St. Brown, Panay Sewell. You got so many offensive weapons that it, Jared Goff's head's going to be spinning. Jamison Williams, we're talking about as just being the number two. He he could potentially be a number one in a lot of offenses if he gets his head on right. So you look at the talent all across the board, it's upper level. And for some, based on the cap, the way they maneuvered, they still got the third most cap space after paying everybody 
So they're maneuvering the cap expertly where they still got some some funds in case of a rainy day. So the situation is just purring like a kitten. And so basically they went from River Rouge plant to like Sterling Heights operation here, fully, fully operational and automated in a great situation. So, hey, man, it's good to see. And I think you're going to enjoy it. You're going to enjoy some of the football. You're going to enjoy the, at least the style of football. Uh, they, it's going to be a situation in which if they need to run, they can run. If they need to pass, they can pass. Pick your poison. Fine, you take away Gibbs, Montgomery, Vaki. Oh, fine, you want to take away our run game? Let's hit you with some uh, Sam Laporta, Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamison Williams. Whew, my God, there's so much to, you know, and then you got, I, I think that the, the new defensive line coach, Terrell Williams, man, he, he instills a lot of confidence. He's like, you guys are joking around calling me a big teddy bear. Wait till the pads come on. Wait till you guys see what's going to happen. I think he's going to get a lot more out of the defensive line, and you're going to see proficient uh, pass rush and run and run stopping efforts. So it's exciting. Uh, and so, look, it's going to be a grind. Look, the best way to put it is there's no way to say that this is a Super Bowl team, but clearly this is a playoff caliber, division winning caliber roster. When you get to the postseason, that's what Dan Campbell was saying. It's just a different animal. Like we'll have the game plan for you, but we need you to kind of be able to adapt if 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 something that they're doing that the 49ers did might need you to adapt and show some elite adaptation and understanding of the game of football. And that's what they're hoping for, some ad-libbing, some opportunities to say, hey, if you know certain things are happening, yeah, you're coached a certain way, but at the same time, there's a certain level of football knowledge you need to have to make a play and be flexible. And that's the next level is to rise up when the, heat's, when the heat gets hotter. This football team, which is expected when the heat got the hottest 17 points up, staring down the face of the Super Bowl, they wilted. Next time that happens, if it happens again, that's a coaching problem. And we'll see. I don't think that'll happen again. I think that this go around, when they get up 17, they're going to go up 35. So look for it. And I think Dan Campbell and Aaron Glenn are super hungry with Ben Johnson knowing that the Super Bowl is in New Orleans. It's full circle. It's fairy tale. Imagine the Lions playing in the Super Bowl where uh, Dan Campbell and Aaron Glenn and Alex Anceloni uh, made their bones. It's fun. Enjoy the ride, but enjoy the break, too. Get away for a minute. Uh, check in with all lines periodically. Check in with the podcast periodically. But uh, check in to make sure because we'll talk about all the previews, all the roster uh, noise, all the roster news additions maybe that could be made, uh, talking about who can make this roster, who, who's on the bubble. We'll have all of that at the podcast and at all lines. So, because this was great, 52 minutes. Um, do you Are you starting to believe, before we get out of here, are you starting to believe this is a Super Bowl team? I feel like it's a Super Bowl team for sure. Yeah. Uh, especially if you've seen uh, news earlier this week where Christian McCaffrey is on the cover of the Madden uh, cover. So Madden curse may be in effect for him. Uh, if he goes down, I mean, that's a definite uh, hindrance to that offense. And look, the 49ers, I feel like, are the team that the Lions are, are chasing. And when I say chasing, I mean, it, it's like you've got one A and you've got one B. I think the Lions have all of the components of a Super Bowl team. They just have to go out there and do it. They just have to be able to execute. Uh, always health is a major factor. So as long as they can stay healthy, I think they've got a great shot. I like the 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 additions and the tweaks that they made to this defense. I think they're going to be much, much better. I think that secondary, which was a, a huge noose around this team's neck last year, I think that's going to be much improved. Uh, I love seeing DJ Reader in the middle of that defense. Uh, I'm expecting Jack Campbell to take a monster step forward and be more productive. So, yeah, I like the way that they have added pieces and continue to develop this defense and that offense, which was already elite. Uh, I feel like you get JMO another year. You kind of open the playbook up a little bit more for him. Uh, I feel like Donovan Peoples-Jones is going to be a contributor on offense for this team. Again, when he came in, they were in a playoff hunt and they were in a Super Bowl hunt. So he didn't get a lot of reps. I think he's going to have a much more expanded role. On top of that, you've got you've got an offensive line, which was already pretty elite. I feel like you've made an addition with with Zenter that's going to be a much bigger deal than you maybe realize. Once we get into the season, you see how much better this offensive line is. I think you're going to be blown away. So I, I think this team has all of the pieces it needs. And they've gone out and they've showed you. You come here, you perform, we will pay you. We will take care of you. 
Guys like to see that. Guys want to see that. Guys already wanted to play for Dan Campbell. Guys now want to come here and play for this organization, which I think is a fantastic thing. No doubt about it. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at AdamRSGROZ. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Make sure, thank you guys for the compliments on the videos that were taken. Um, Look, quite frankly, uh, we've been podcasting since 2013. Only the reason why a a company like SI would like to to work with Detroit Sports Podcast is because you guys are engaged. You like listening to the shows. You like being part of the action. You like seeing the inside knowledge. And that's all we're trying to do is make you part of it. Uh, We're no different than anybody out there. We're just individuals that love and are passionate about Detroit sports. And we feel like the best way to present the information is via podcasting. And that's why we do it. And it shows when you see podcasts that are out there that feel forced, you can tell those that love it and those that are just doing it to get by because their editor told them to do it. But hell, I still take pride. Adam and I take pride in knowing that every single outlet is doing a podcast except the Detroit News, I believe, is not doing one for football, maybe in other areas as well. But M Live, Free Press, all of them, all the blogs, they've incorporated podcasts. And it's imp- because it's fun, because it's additional way of, part- of connecting with the authors, is connecting with the people that are there. And I think you guys recognize that we love doing it and we love bringing you the information, love firing up the microphone to talk to my guy Adam get his opinion, his strong opinions in the world of Detroit sports, whether it be the, you know, his love of the Florida Panthers. He put it out there and he's wrecking the NHL world by having this love for the Panthers. That's fine. Let's go Florida. Yeah. Florida probably going to close it out. They're just too much. And even though, you know, the NHL and NBA finals are not as competitive as we would like, we're checking in with them as well. And it's fun to be part of the, of the Detroit sports scene in the community as we try to figure out how the Wings can get to the next level, how the Tigers can get to the next level as well. We'll be here for it here at Doc and Jock on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. You fucking podcasters. I said don't let them in here. <laughs>